the Aquasidae of Sunday, 5th December, 1971, strikes a somber note. It marks the beginning of the final funeral rites for the late Nana Otunfo, Sir Osei Ajman Prempe II. The doleful toxin strains of the Odruja flute announce deep sense of loss. It is the evening of the warrior's adai, and the young warrior keeps awake with the royal family, his palace musicians and functionaries. He is preparing himself to shoulder the strains and burdens of his office. Throughout the night, the wake is being kept in every stool house with intermittent firing of musketry by the Ancombia and the Marere clans. The ascending he must reflect in his person the collective feelings of his people. He must be calm and bear his sorrows with dignity and fortitude. Asante warriors and mourners sing war songs as they march with their commanders to pay their last respects to their commander-in-chief, the late Asante Hini, Nana Otunfo, Sir Osei Ajman Prempe II. Nana Otunfo Pukuwal II appears in the Batekelkese, the royal ceremonial battle dress to be acclaimed as the new commander-in-chief. Preceded by another symbol of his office, a stool, he joins the procession. Riding in the royal palanquin and flanked by courtiers and attendants, Nana Opokuware leads his armies in the symbolic warrior dance, the phantom from Atopletia. Household guards, the Atumutufo, in their ceremonial dress. Among the chiefs in the procession is the Isumankwahini, to see that no evil or ill luck shall mar the solemn ceremonies. Earlier, he had prophesied fair weather throughout the period of national mourning. His feathered cap is the bearer of the Mpumpuncio State Sword, the Excalibur of the Asante Kings. And still, the mourners come in ever-growing numbers. And the Mampoini, who has had to supervise the earlier burial arrangements and the instrument of Nana Okuari II, leads his people to the site for the gun salute. Nana Fukuwari salutes and bids Nana Prempe a last farewell. Next 
backstage, paramount chiefs, divisional chiefs, attendants, court officials, and distinguished guests from all over Ghana continue to flock to the Gebrim, the scene of the customary rite where the Asante Hine, riding in state, will sit, distribute drinks, and receive words of condolence and donations. by the shield bearers. With the fascinating shield dance, the lady members of the royal family have come to greet and comfort the Asante Hini. With them is the mother of the nation, the queen mother of Asante in deep mourning. Clad in the company mourning cloth and symbolic family fronds, the Asante Hini sits in state to receive sympathizers who have come to mourn with him. These include representatives of the houses of chiefs, queen chiefs, and commanders and occupants of princely stools, like the Chidomhini, the commander of the rear army, and Nana Mampoini, the occupant of the silver stool, is also there to pay homage. to express their feelings of sorrow and sympathy to the music of the Kete and Adwa drums in symbolic gesture movements and miming, counseling the Asante Hini to show fortitude in his bereavement. an expression of traditional friendship, the Yana has sent a special delegation of chiefs and dancers and a lady musketeer. A young girl leading the Adoswa procession, bearing gifts and displaying wealth, delivers a message from the Asante Hines wife in dance language. You are not alone. I share your sorrows. Be strong to support me, she says as she hangs the Arisnia doll necklace round the Asante Hines neck. The Asante Hines cousin-in-law sends a full retinue of Adaswa maids in waiting, and the Adaswa Hima, the Adaswa queen, with a similar procession to exhibit her traditional burial articles to the rhythms of the royal Kete drums.
the fast is broken, and members of the royal family purify themselves by shaving off their hair and paring their nails. These are collected and deposited in the Abuchiakua, the funeral urn, as a sign of love, solidarity, and continuity of the life cycle. Amidst drumming and firing of musketry, the Wirempehini, the chief of the people who hold the secret of the royal household, the stool carriers and the bandman who return from a secret grove with the consecrated stool of the late Sir Oseyajman Prempe II to be added to the stools of his predecessors in the stool's chapel. Throughout the previous night, the selected stool and the golden stool have been at an all-night vigil of ritual invocation for the spirit, Sunsum, of the late Asantehini to inhabit the stool as a shrine and a permanent memorial to his reign. The state mourning is over. The funeral urn has been deposited in a chapel at Bremen Mausoleum, and the path has been closed to death. A new reign has begun. The young tree which replaced the old has withstood the first stresses of its young life. From now, the new Asante Hini, Nana Opokuware, may wear jewelry with members of the royal family. The late Otunfo Se Osei Ajman has been born in the spirit world and victory has been won over death. people from many regions and all walks of life come to greet and congratulate the Asante Hini and to bid him farewell. smiles now as he moves to the stool chapel to commune with his predecessors. He carries a musket 
as the new defender and leader of his people. With the Atumpan drummers all hail him as the new moon. To the Ashanti Ghana, the king never dies. For the event of a king's death is taken as a re-entry to the ancestral and is announced only in circumlocutions, even on the talking drums. The nation will nonetheless weep and wail to express its grief until a new monarch ascends the golden stool. A monarch who in the traditional imagery will restore to his people the shelter of their king's umbrella and thus save them from being scourged to death by the sun. So as they pay their last respects to their king and master, these horn blowers are also hopeful that soon they will adulate another descendant of Osei and Poku and recount to him the history of the nation. To locate another eagle for the nation is the constitutional duty of the Queen Mother, now the Regent. The process of nomination may appear smooth and easy, but there are always heirs to choose from. And rival claims for accession to the Golding Stool are made behind the scenes. The king makers of the royal household, that is, the occupants of the Jesse and Kobia and Manwere stools, may have to face an uphill task to come to a conclusion. After reaching a unanimous decision, the kingmakers will communicate to the Queen Mother that they pronounce her nominee free from such serious diseases as leprosy, epilepsy, blindness, and sterility. Besides, he is not giving to drunkenness, gambling, fornication, and haughtiness. But that does not end the nomination. same physical and moral analysis are done by yet another body, the Kumasi State Council. Under the leadership of the principal right-wing chief of Kumasi, the Banta Mahini, the councillors will decide whether they accept or reject the first nominated heir. And what conclusion will they reach? Yes or no? It is yes. It is concerted yes for Berima Poku the nominee. For him, the twilight of suspense has broken away, and with the Queen Mother, he can now shed tears of joy. Tears of joy for his late uncle's gun to be given to him, and for the golden stool. The grove of the historic priests at Comfuanoche, at Agona in Ashanti, being visited today, on the occasion of the making of a new king, takes us back to history. How and when the Ashanti nation and the golden stool came into being. Until the end of the 17th century, Kumasi was a subject state of the Dentura nation, to whose king it sent gold, dust, and wives annually as tribute. With the help and wise counsel of the priest, Anochi, the great ancestor chief of Agona, Kumasi was determined to break and cast off the yoke of silk.
first, Kumasi formed a loose union with nearby states. When sufficient strength had been mobilized through unity, hatred for the common enemy inspired King and the other chiefs of the union to battle it out with Dendera. This was the famous battle fought at Thiasi near Kumasi in about 1701. The Dendera's were vanquished. In Tim Jackery, the king of the Dendera's was captured and beheaded. Some of the weapons used to silence Dendera in the Battle of Fiasi have been kept as museum pieces in the Priest and Notches Grove at Aguna. The Ashanti nation, like this stone in front of the house of the celebrated priest Anoche, has been able to weather centuries of storms because of the one main visible symbol of unity, the golden stool. The paramount sacredness of the golden stool was demonstrated in 1896 by Ashanti's submission to the deportation of their king, Prempe I, by the colonial government. Rather than resort to war, in which they feared they might risk the loss of the golden stool, they allowed the loss of their king by exile to the Seychelles. Before King Prempe I was sent to the Seychelles, he and his attendants, including his parents, were kept at the Almina Castle. It was achieved. Now in suit on his arrival at Second D in November 1924, he was received at the Deba by the then governor, Gagesburg. Today, the links of history continue to chain together as time moves on with Berima Kuku Edusei, the successful nominee to the Golden Stool of Ashanti. After a period of confinement following his nomination, the king-elect now emerges for a public introduction. On this occasion, the king-elect will also take the oath of his high office before the elders of the Kumasi state. To the people, indeed to the whole kingdom, Nana Poku is coming to supply a vital spiritual link with the ancestors, a link which has been missing since the departure of a tomb force there, Osei Ajiman Prempa II, for the spirit world. The ceremony of public introduction and the taking of the oath of office together constitute one of the important procedural and constitutional requirements that the king-elect has to fulfill before he can ascend the golden stool. Then, within Pomponcio's state sword in hand and facing the queen mother, he swears. I am a descendant of Osei and Opoku, of Bunsu and Ajiman. I am a direct nephew of Prempe. Today, the soul of Ajiman Prempe has gone whence it came and his gun lies idle. By your grace, and by the grace of the people of Kumasi, you have presented the gun to me. If I do not protect and govern you well, as did my forebears, I swear the great oath. So swears the king-elect that he shall give the kingdom a good government. Let us rejoice. Let us raise cheers of congratulations to our new monarch, Berima Kweku Eduse, as at this hour he assumes a new name, a tomb for Pokuware II of Ashanti. The sounds of drums join the voices of the people in raising shouts of thanksgiving to God Almighty and to the ancestors for their goodwill. And for being installed as their ruler today, 
The new king expresses his sincere gratitude to the chiefs and people, but to the clan chiefs of Kumasi and to the component states who are represented at this function by their spokesmen, the king will also present appropriate sums of money as laid down by the Ashanti constitution. On the following day, the monarch is introduced to the Manshia Palace, the Himfie. Here, the elders of Kumasi come and pay their respects to him and to wish him well. Although he can now sit in council or court as a ruler, the new monarch is not expected to hold an opinion of his own and to the instrument or formal accession to the Golding Stool. During this period, he is schooled in the structure and organization of the palace. He is told about rights relating to the Golding Stool and the Black Stools, in addition to an introduction to the stool house itself. The elders of Kumasi take this opportunity to visit him and offer advice on matters of importance to the kingdom and on statecraft. Throughout the constitutional processes enacted in the making of the new king, the state drums, including this one, have also been actively involved. But today, another memorial is being raised to the late king. For it is 40 days ago when Otumfu Ajiman, the new monarch's predecessor and maternal uncle, set out on his journey to the spirit world. Monarch, or an ordinary individual for that matter, passes away, Funeral rites are performed on the eighth day, then on the Philippe de Nation, in the 40th day celebrations, in honor of his predecessor. His installation has to be timely. So today, Nanao Kokuwari, the, the clan chiefs of Kumasi, is an act of honor, to do honor to the departed. Funeral rites may help to separate the dead from the living. But on such occasions, the dead, the ancestors, and the gather in according honor to the departed king. The link between the ancestors and the living, the new king. And in the performance to today, the state drums join up to console him. They join up to express their sincere and profound sympathy with him. They are also feeling out to inspire him they are king and master. To the late king, a memorial which is symbolized by the celebrations. the firing of musketry. This brings together the paramount chiefs of the component states, the Amanhine, the divisional chiefs from the various states and the people. Literally speaking, the whole kingdom assembles together to enable the Asantehine designate to demonstrate his ability to lead Asantehine, the Ashanti nation. The Asantehine, as the king of the Ashanti nation, is expected to fulfill different parts and functions. A constitutional head, a religious head, and a chief warrior all rolled into one. In the olden days of the chief warrior, the Asantehine was a grand captain by whose leadership and prowess the nation marched victoriously through theaters of war. 
And so the clan chiefs of Kumasi today are closely identifying themselves here with the making of their new king. They, as well as the other paramount chiefs of the kingdom, are looking forward pensively to the emergence of their son Tahini elect. He who is to show forth the ancient martial spirit that animated King Osei Tutu, the great, great ancestor in the creation and consolidation of the Ashanti nation. As a grand captain of his chiefs and people, Nanao Pukuware II wears for this occasion the grand military tunic of his forebears, the Batakarikesia. The wearing of this grand tunic, which will again be worn when the Otumfo is celebrating the grand funeral of his immediate predecessor, adds up to the new king's capacity. His moral and spiritual capacity to command the Ashanti forces on the battlefield. Today, a practical demonstration of his ability in statecraft to be seen during his reign. Tradition demands that the Otumfo should fire his gun three times, and to each fire, the Otumfo's men at arms respond with a salvo. And the success of the Otumfo's demonstration today is acknowledged by his next in command in the kingdom, the paramount chief of Mambong. It is in the little hours of the morning that the new king, Nanao Pukuware II, sits in state outside the palace to receive pledges of allegiance from each of the 13 paramount chiefs of the kingdom. The paramount chiefs, who, only a couple of hours earlier, had propped him up to ascend formally the golden stool of Ashanti. With the Mpomponsom state sword, each of them takes the oath of allegiance to the new monarch. That in rain or shine, at noon or at night, except in circumstances of ill health, each will give a loyal response to the king's call and leadership. The paramount chief of the Agona state, he who occupies the priest Anoti's tool, a Komfuanoti who helped to found the nation and for which he created golden stool. Paramount Chief of Mampong, Nana Atakura Meniampong II, he who sits upon the silver stool of Ashanti. In the hierarchy of the Ashanti Kingdom, Nana Mampong Hini ranks next to Yasante Hini. processes of king-making have been successfully performed. Nanao Pukuware II comes out now as fully-fledged king to meet his people, this time at a thanksgiving deva. Songs of felicitation by the women in honor of the new king. Songs of praise and thanks to Chidiampong, the almighty god. for Pukuwari II now sits in state to receive the congratulations and the goodwill of the chiefs and elders. Today, Nano Pukuwari II has restored to his people the shelter of the king's umbrella, for he has become the father of the nation. As the constitutional head, the chiefs and people are looking up to him with confidence for a good government. They expect him to emulate the sterling qualities of his great predecessors, Osei and Apoku.
From the royal lineage of the Yoko clan of Kumasi has emerged another Opokowari. The Yoko clan, one of the seven main clans upon which the Ashanti family system is based. A system from which the institution of chieftaincy has sprung. Today, the drums have joined the voices of the people to raise echoes of felicitation across the kingdom. That Nano Pukuwari has been able to make all the rungs in the constitutional ladder of kingmaking. His nomination, his election and installation, all culminating in the series of installment ceremonies. Let the drums perform again and again for a king. Let the drums peel out for Nano Pukuwari II, or Tumfo Pukuwari, who at the age of 51 has risen from the legal profession. Tumfo Pokuwari II, who, with a store of public experience behind him, has come to ascend the golden stool of Ashanti as the new king of his people. The people who have thus been saved from being scourged to death by the sun. For them and for the nation, another mighty eagle has been found. A few hours earlier, the Duchess of Kent had flown into Accra. Governor Sir Charles Arden Clark and Prime Minister Dr. Kwame Nkrumah were there to receive her. With her, the Duchess of Kent brings the Queen's mandate, which is to change the constitutional status of this country, and the Queen's Godspeed to this newest dominion of the British Commonwealth. For Dr. Nkrumah, main architect of Ghana's independence, this is a day of fulfillment. Her gracious task is formally to untie, in the name of the Queen and the British people, the political bonds of colonial rule. It is a task that could be framed only by a great people conscious of its strength, willing to move with the times, jealous of its good name. As she enters our capital city, chiefs and notables welcome her in the old way. These have always been our custom. A traditional libation is poured that God should give his blessing. Old coasters like me have seen a few libations in our time, but none as happy as this one. So many handshakes and introductions, all the ceremonial occasions of a people whose care for dignity is deep and courteous. We are a nation born with a mission. The point is so plain that nobody can miss it, and we rightly proclaim our acceptance of this assignment by planting in the middle of our national flag the lodestar of hope for all the black peoples of Africa. We are to demonstrate to our fellows, not with high words, but by the quality of our national life, that indeed it is a good and a necessary thing to be a free people. That is fact. God has given black Africans also, as he has given everybody else, the capacity to attain the full stature of man. more than a hymn today, it's many things. It's a thanksgiving, a pledge for the future, a way of saying what you feel when the words won't come. of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Ghost be upon you, upon our rulers and chiefs, and upon this nation, now and always. Amen. The chiefs and paramount chiefs and kings of rulers by tradition have also journeyed to greet Her Royal Highness. From the green hills of Ashanti and the far savannas of the north, from the forest land beyond the Volta River and the surf-rimmed Blue Atlantic shore, they're here with their tribal dignitaries, with their crowns and coronets of beaten gold, their golden staffs of authority and judgment. the insignia of an old tradition. Our land was not made yesterday. Our beginnings return into the midst of a thousand years. The name we have chosen, Ghana, is the name of an African civilization that flourished and was famous for its wealth and civic order in centuries before the Normans crossed the English Channel, whose name was still alive upon the lips of men when Columbus found America. And now the wheel of history comes full circle. After these centuries, after slavery, conquest, colonial rule, after trusteeship, partnership, anything but freedom, now at last the old independence is recovered. The chiefs assert once more their pride and dignity, glittering and potent symbols of the link between what is long since gone and what is now to come. the welcome of a nation determined to be modern, up to date. Square bashing, here and blind and swear, just like everyone else. Never mind, they're all right. I've served with them, Burma and the Far East. Africans aren't right for independence. That's what a lot of us thought. Well, it looked as though we were wrong. Not right for independence. They said it and they said it and they said it. Boy, we got sort of tired of hearing that word. Sure, we'll make plenty of muddles and mistakes, but it's better to make your own mistakes than to suffer from the mistakes that others make for you. Gladness, sadness, dignity, and deep delight. The human thing. All of this speaks through their dance. Red, gold, green. The colors of the Ghana flag. That's red for the self-sacrifice, the lives that were the cost of Ghana's freedom. And gold for its mind and green for its tall and brilliant forests. These are the colors that make a background to the Black Star of Ghana, the lodestar of African freedom. running races, bicycle races, competitions up and down the length and breadth of the land. Dancing competitions, hair plaiting competitions, singing, talking, any kind of competition.
These are all fishermen. They spend their lives in paddling out the cocoa that Ghana grows and delivering it to ocean steamers. Now, don't get it wrong, please. They have to run through the surf here in Accra, but we've modern harbors too. Takaradi, for instance. run when the weather's as warm as this. Depends on your luck, they say. Horses and handsome women, they seem to go together no matter where you are. I'll tell you a story about it if I had the time. I've heard it said that Ghana has the prettiest girls in all of Africa. Well, Africa is big. Still, I wouldn't be surprised. A guest of the Prime Minister picks a winner. for Miss Ghana, winner in the nationwide contest for Ghana's loveliest girl. Now, what do they think about these gorgeous creatures? What do they say? My name is Monica Anubasia, and I'm very glad to be the most beautiful girl of Ghana. Good luck, Monica. Fortnight's trip to England, that's her vibe. Rock and roll looked like it had long gray whiskers. That's Steve Van, all right. That's right out of yesterday and night. <laughs> that night, a state banquet at Ghana's new luxury hotel, the Ambassador in Accra. For Sir Charles Arden Clark, Governor of the Gold Coast, and now to be the first Governor General of Ghana, this is the climax of a long and notable career. During his distinguished governorship, Ghana becomes the first of Africa's colonies to win full independence. He proposes the toast of honor. Mr. Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, my lords, none and none, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the toast of Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Kent. Happy the time when an imperial people knows how to withdraw without bloodshed, without too much domain. I count it a privilege to have been asked by the Queen to take her part in a moment of such significance in the long and colorful history, not only of Ghana, but of the African continent as a whole. I offer my warmest good wishes for the future happiness of Ghana. May God bless and guide your endeavors. The Prime Minister replied, his words make history. Never before has any colony heard such words. With them, the subjection of Africa begins to end. They speak the independent future of his own country. They foretell the independent future of a continent. Our independence. It will be the policy of the government of Ghana to develop the closest possible contact with all other parts of the world. Rich in many things, in cocoa, in mines of diamonds and gold, in tall forests. 
but rich in faith and confidence as well, Ghana builds for the future. Schools, clinics, hospitals, factories, roads, harbors, power stations. A memorial to comradeship and friendship. The battles fought side by side and won. I can remember the old days, the bush and what it meant. Being carried in a hammock, having baths in portable contraptions, you have no idea how darned uncomfortable. Fever, yes, and the way we dealt with it. Quinine and whiskey. Mind you, all that stopped us from settling here. That's why, you know, this country isn't like Kenya. And now, it never will be like Kenya. Courts of law, museums, libraries, hotels, modern housing, seats of learning. All the fabric and the apparatus of a modern state. University College of the Gold Coast. Now of Ghana, of course. It was founded a handful of years ago as an academic daughter of London University, an enduring and valuable connection. Hundreds of young men and women have passed through our hands. On the quality of scholarship and teaching here, much of the future of this country will depend. We like to think that we are the keystone of that future. But freedom was not given. Men had to win it, struggle for it. Those who fell are not forgotten. I now have the great privilege and pleasure to unveil this national monument. Out of the darkness, the pledge and the promise. Here, but a handful of years ago, men laid down their lives for a cause that was not yet won, for freedom, for justice. Too long up there, making us other people's property. But behind that flag, fine, sincere people devoted to this country's good. There is friendship and affection between us. Midnight, March the 6th, 1957. Independence. Ghana belongs to herself, a dominion of the Commonwealth and a member of the United Nations. It is 69 years since the first African unofficial member was nominated to the old Legislative Council of the Gold Coast Colony. It is six years since the first properly democratic elections were permitted. Yesterday, this parliament was subject to the Parliament of Britain. Today, its members owe loyalty only to the people of Ghana. Thus ends, with dignity and honor, a hundred years of colonial occupation and colonial rule. With fitting ceremony, the Duchess of Kent reads to the representatives of Ghana in Parliament assembled the Queen's message of freedom. She tells them of the Queen's pride that today a new member of the Commonwealth is born. She gives them the Queen's congratulations and the Queen's best wishes. I have it in command from the Queen to read to you the following message from Her Majesty to her people in Ghana. I have entrusted to my aunt the duty of opening on my behalf the first session of the Parliament of Ghana. My thoughts are with you on this great day as you take up the full responsibilities of independent nationhood. It is my earnest and confident belief that my people in Ghana will go forward in freedom and justice, in unity among themselves, and in brotherhood with all the peoples of the Commonwealth. God bless you all. Elizabeth R. The Prime Minister goes to the throne and receives the Queen's message. From now onward, these will be the proceedings of a sovereign parliament. Waiting outside to see her, many thousands of people cheer Her Royal Highness. Now 
a great change is made, peacefully, in good friendship, in a manner befitting the will of the people of Ghana and the will of the people of Britain. I suppose we could have hung on, of course. We could have grit our teeth and called in the troops and somehow muddled through, shot our way through. That's what it would have meant. Bad for other people, though, and bad for us. Out of date, greedy, stupid. Stupid, yes. Stupid even more than greedy. I come from India. I remember how we felt about the British before they decided to leave India. And I know how we Indians feel about them now. We used to dislike the British. We don't now. Triumph for his cause, for those who believed in that cause, who followed him. Yes, it looks easy now, but it was not easy. He tramped the streets for work. He took what jobs he could get. He scrubbed floors. He wiped dishes. Moved hunks of carcass in a soap factory. Kwame Nkrumah tells the people they're a free nation. Another nation in the world added to so many. Does that help? Remember this. Until the peoples are nations, they will not be recognized. And until the nations are free, they will not have peace. That is why the people shout for freedom. My friend, I'm telling you, I won't forget it. It wasn't because of that one man. It was just all of us happy. Ago! At long last, the battle has ended. And then, Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. wakes up, the sleepy giant stirs. Egypt, Ethiopia, Liberia, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, Sudan, Ghana. These govern themselves. Others will follow, not in hatred, not in fear, but to raise mankind to its feet, all mankind. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and so that after all, the black man is capable of managing all of us. We are going to demonstrate to the world, to the other nations, young as we are, that we are prepared to lay our own foundation. We are going to see that we create our own African personality and identity. And we again rededicate ourselves, not only in the struggle to emancipate other territories in Africa, our independence is meaningless unless it links up the total break of the African continent. Now I want you all, those who have hats on, to take off your hat and let the band raise our national anthem. And from now on, that national anthem is the national anthem of the Gogo to be played on all occasions. islands of African humanity begin now to be joined to the main. The barriers go down. The world grows up. For humanity is one, indivisible. That is the strength we have to make a better world. The black and the brown, the white and the yellow, we are members one of another. <laughs> Sit down. Yeah. May God bless you. Courage, freedom. These are Ghana's words for you.
wherever you are, whoever you are. That we, humanity, have nothing to fear but our own denial of freedom. So let us go forward together, for humanity is one. Humanity is indivisible. Indivisible. in that spirit salute the birth of the Second Republic of Ghana. Long live Ghana. From the NLC to the Buzia regime, Buzia, for example, was uh, the government was very much interested in rural development. Of course, they didn't have uh, long enough time. Uh, then you had the Achampon era. It is therefore imperative that you join us in observing the principles of our revolution by being modest, honest, approachable, understanding, courteous, and sympathetic when we are trying to break away from the old. In this connection, I also want to advise the general public to reciprocate so that a congenial atmosphere may be created for all of us to work for the good of Ghana. Long live the Ghana Armed Forces. Long live the revolution. Long live the National Redemption Council. Long live Ghana. As you go home, remember that the revolution continues unabated. In the other regions of Ghana, demonstrations of support for the NRC took place simultaneously. The government had achieved much in its first year in office, and Ghanaians were justifiably happy. He left a lot to technicians and officials to implement. And the ceremony at the border town of Aflao the two heads of state, Colonel Achampong of Ghana and President Ayadema of Togo, ceremoniously opened the customs barrier between the two sister states. Traffic between the two states can now move 24 hours a day. page has been opened in the annals of Ghana-Togo relations. The two countries have moved a step closer to the goal of African unity. On June 4, 1979, the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council came on the political scene. Massive demonstrations throughout the length and breadth of the country were held in support of the revolution. Addressing a Mammoth Students Rally at the University of Ghana, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings said that they were motivated by a burning desire to ensure that the incoming political administration was given the right atmosphere within which to take all necessary steps to bring stability and prosperity to the nation. The AFRC was all out to remove mismanagement, maladministration, corruption at high places, abuse of power by the well-to-do, and a conscienceless display of affluence by a few well-to-do. Probity and accountability was the order of the day. The most valuable legacy the AFRC left behind was honesty and accountability.
founding fathers have been dashed to the ground. Today, we live as in a nightmare. Our economy is shattered. Chronic shortages of basic commodities characterize our everyday life. Many Ghanaians of metal have left our shores to seek their livelihood elsewhere. Never have Ghanaians known such humiliation. In 1979, Ghanaians decided to go back to the ballot box to elect a new leader for the Third Republic. I have visited 115 constituencies out of 140. And I'm telling you, the people of Jema and Greater Accra, that everywhere, everywhere, they are determined to vote solidly for the popular front. So again about what to do with the economy, including even uh, realignment of the currency and so on. As president of the Third Republic of Ghana, Dr. Hila Liman tried to rebuild Ghana's image with sister African countries. 
unfortunately, uh, th there were divisions within the government, which uh, were natural, because a champion had been against uh, this devaluation. That was one of the reasons why he uh, took power. And many people, uh, many of the OCPP, did not like the idea of devaluation. PNDC came. They also f had to find some time to, f uh, uh, to find their feet. And they thought of certain measures which they tried to implement. For example, prices were to be kept low and so on. Uh, there was halo baloo when I increased the price of milk from 80 pesos to three cities. I think, I do remember. And now I don't know, it's about 90 or so. The PNDC then went to IMF for assistance to recover the economy. Most of the people who supported the new regime uh, uh, had great expectations. And they did not uh, expect prices to go up or certain measures to be taken. It took some time. Then later on, it was quite clear that we had to go to the IMF and take certain measures. And the government courageously uh, took that path. In 1992, Ghanaians again decided to go back to the ballot box. In preparation for the presidential and parliamentary elections, some political parties have been holding congresses to elect their presidential candidates. At the National Delegates Congress of the New Patriotic Party, 2,000 delegates, 10 from each region, met to choose a flag bearer from among six contestants. The delegates were called constituency by constituency to cast their votes. For two whole hours, delegates were kept in a suspense. been touched by the confidence you have reposed in me by giving me your mandate to be the flag bearer of this great party of ours. Another political party, the Eagle Party, also held a delegate congress to elect a leader. Somebody who is dynamic, somebody who is strong, who is beautiful, who can do the rest. By acclamation, 50 delegates present returned President J.J. Rawlings unopposed as its presidential candidate. In the last elections, the Eagle Party went into electoral alliance with the ruling National Democratic Congress. Mr. President, is your nominee for the presidential contest for 96? Mr. Uraku Amofa, Deputy Minister of Tourism. The ruling National Democratic Congress, NDC, also held a rap in which they were addressed by the leader of the party, President J.J. Rawlings. Victory for democracy, victory for our independence, and victory for all Ghanaians.
as our gallant soldiers march on this day of inaugurating a new president, the independence of the Ghanaian is being preserved and protected. The presence of leaders of sister nations give meaning to Ghanaians linking their independence with other sister nations. General Sani Abacha of Nigeria was there to grace the occasion. As was said by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of the First Republic, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's linked to the total liberation of Africa. Does die at any time. Great. What is the feeling of the people who fought for our independence? Service when staying in our position, many you see recently uh, the president tried all his best to give the ex servicemen who have been from 39 to 45 pension about from 19 about from 1980, which we are enjoying now. But it still is very small, it pays very, very little. See, we must enjoy something small, remain few of us. Our dreams, yeah. our hopes and aspiration is being realized gradually. We have not fully got what we want. We have not fully got what we want. For instance, our pension was not on, but it was the present uh, president, General Rollins, uh, 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 President Rollins, who gave this first step of the pension. And we are still requesting for more in order to get to the actual position of the pension we require. Because we fought for the entire country. We didn't fight for any other person. And if we had not gone there, the enemy could have come here. And that was why we're having blackout in this country during the war. And that was why SS Ankara was sunk here at the, port, at the, at the seaport here. It means the, the war was coming here gradually. So it was good for us to go there and stop the war. And we stopped the war, we came back, we didn't find what we really, uh, the compensation which we, we deserve until the present government try, and they are still trying to compensate us. So we're still waiting. Ma, you are like a hiccup, you know, I'm going to be in Ghana and I'm going to be in Ghana. 
In the memory of the fallen heroes, this cenotaph was built. This is how we remember Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Atipu, and Private Odate Lamte, the gallant soldiers who fell on 28 February 1948, leading to our independence on the 6th of March 1957.